There is no reason based on seven specific indicators, which it found to be, quote, indicators of genocidal intent in the international case law. Nor has Myanmar challenged the propriety of the fact-finding mission's use of these seven indicators, or any one of them, for inferring genocidal intent. Professor Akhavan identified them on Tuesday. I call them to your attention today only for the purpose of considering what Myanmar said or failed to say about them yesterday. This is the first indicator of genocidal intent. First, the Tatmadaw's extreme brutality during its attacks on the Rohingya. Professor Akhavan and Mr. Lowenstein gave you many heart-rending examples of this from the reports of the UN fact-finding mission. Myanmar did not deny any of it. In fact, its agent admitted that, quote, it cannot be ruled out that disproportionate force was used by members of the defense services. Second, the organized nature of the Tatmadaw's destruction. Mr. Lowenstein showed you how the Tatmadaw employed the same brutal tactics in each Rohingya village, in clearance operations that were planned and ordered by senior military staff. Myanmar did not deny this. Nor did they deny that 392 Rohingya villages were systematically destroyed, either totally or partially, during these operations. Third, the enormity and nature of the sexual violence perpetrated against women and girls during the clearance operations. We heard nothing about sexual violence from Myanmar yesterday. Not a single word about it, not from the agent, not from any of their counsel. Because it is undeniable and unspeakable, they chose to ignore it completely. I can't really blame them. I would hate to be the one having to defend it. Fourth, the insulting, derogatory, racist, an exclusionary utterance of Myanmar officials and others prior, during, and after the clearance operations. Myanmar did not deny any of this either, nor could it. The agent even underscored its significance. Quote, hate narratives are not simply confined to hate speech. Language that contributes to extreme polarization also amounts to hate narratives. And here is such a narrative from the Facebook page of Senior General Min Ong Lang, the Commander-in-Chief of the Tatmadaw, before Facebook took his page down. Posted at the height of the 2017 clearance operations, it described, quote, the Bengali problem as an as yet, quote, unfinished job that the government in office is taking great care in solving. He added, we openly declare that absolutely our country has no Rohingya race. Returning to the seven indicators of genocidal intent. Fifth, 
the existence of discriminatory plans and policies, such as the citizenship law and the national verification card process, as well as the government's efforts to clear, raise, confiscate, and build on land in a manner that sought to change the demographic and ethnic composition of Rakhine State. Again, no denial by Myanmar. How could it? Myanmar's laws and policies overtly and expressly discriminate against the Rohingya. All the agent could say was that birth certificates would now be issued regardless of religious background, but not citizenship, and nothing about the confiscation of Rohingya lands. Six, the government's tolerance for public rhetoric of hatred and contempt for the Rohingya. Myanmar did not deny this either. And seventh, the state's failure to investigate and prosecute gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law. This is the only indicator of genocidal intent, the only one of the seven that Myanmar has disputed. The agent herself asked, quote, can there be genocidal intent on the part of a state that actively investigates, prosecutes, and punishes soldiers and officers who are accused of wrongdoing? Mr. President, we could not help but ask ourselves, what state is she talking about? It is certainly not Myanmar. The agent herself made this perfectly clear. Quote, under its 2008 constitution, Myanmar has a military justice system. Criminal cases against soldiers or officers for possible war crimes committed in Rakhine must be investigated and prosecuted by that system. To her credit, the agent acknowledged the difficulties with such a system. Quote, it is never easy for armed forces to recognize self-interest in accountability for their members and to implement a will to accountability through actual investigations and prosecutions. It certainly isn't easy in Myanmar. How can anyone possibly expect the Tat Madaw to hold itself accountable for genocidal acts against the Rohingya when six of its top generals, including the Commander-in-Chief, Senior General Min Ong Hlaing, have all been accused of genocide by the UN fact-finding mission and recommended for criminal prosecution. In addition to Senior General Min Ong Hlaing, these include the Deputy Commander-in-Chief, Vice Senior General So Win, and the commanders of the two Light Infantry Divisions, the 33rd and the 99th, which were primarily responsible for carrying out the clearance operations against the Rohingya, Brigadier General Ong Ong and Brigadier General Than U. Two days ago, on 10 December, International Human Rights Day, the United States government imposed sanctions on all of them. The official announcement by the U.S. Department of the Treasury at tab 25 of your folders described the crimes of which they are accused. When you read this document, you will see under the name of each of these generals, 
that these are the same genocidal acts that the UN fact-finding mission reported and that Professor Akhavan and Mr. Lowenstein described on Tuesday. Of particular interest, in light of the agent's comment on accountability, the United States government warned that, quote, such abuses and the continuing impunity must stop. Burma's military must address the climate of impunity and cease abuses and violations of universally accepted human rights. It should come as no surprise then that the Tatmadaw has not been willing to investigate, prosecute, or punish its own members for crimes against the Rohingya. There has been just one prosecution, which was initiated only in response to an international outcry and ended with full pardons issued to the perpetrators. I beg the court's forgiveness for displaying these photographs at tab 26, which are difficult to look at and some in the courtroom might wish to look away. But the extreme brutality of the Tatmadaw toward the Rohingya is part of the evidence of genocidal intent. Even Myanmar has not denied this. This is a photo obtained by Reuters reporters of 10 Rohingya men in Tatmadaw custody with their wrists tied behind their backs at In Din in Rakhine State. This is a photo obtained by the same reporters immediately after they were executed at point blank range. After the photos were published worldwide, the Tatmadaw made an arrest, not of the soldiers who committed these brutal murders, but of the Reuters reporters. They were tried by a military court, convicted of violating the Official Secrets Act, and sentenced to seven years of imprisonment. The international community came down hard on Myanmar for this, and the Tatmadaw eventually put the killers on trial and sentenced them, but gave them full military pardons after serving only seven months. The message was not that soldiers would be held accountable for crimes against the Rohingya, but exactly the opposite. Even the agent admitted, quote, Many of us in Myanmar were unhappy with the pardons. Unhappy, perhaps, but absolutely unable to do anything about it. The agent and Professor Okoa mentioned one other prosecutor. What they neglected to tell you was that the victims were not Rohingyas and the crime was not committed in Rakhine State. It had nothing to do with the Rohingya. We were also told about the initiation of a new court martial proceeding on 25 November 2019, two weeks after the Gambia's application was filed and two weeks before these hearings began. Could there be any connection? Reference was made yesterday to an international commission of inquiry created by Myanmar to investigate events in Rakhine State, told by the agent that it might lead to new prosecutions. But that is not how the chair of the commission sees it. She stated very clearly that, quote, there will be no blaming of anybody, no finger pointing of anybody because we don't achieve anything by that procedure. On Tuesday, we called your attention to the observations of the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Myanmar. She wrote, 
as you will recall, quote, those responsible for these violations enjoy impunity, which perpetuates the devastating cycle of abuse, and that Myanmar is, quote, incapable of delivering accountability. Now perhaps you can better appreciate how well-founded these observations are. Mr. President, Myanmar's agent told you that Myanmar is, quote, committed to the voluntary, safe, and dignified repatriation of displaced persons from Rakhine under the framework agreement reached between Bangladesh and Myanmar. She then asked another rhetorical question, quote, how can there be an ongoing genocide or genocidal intent when these concrete steps are being taken in Rakhine? Professor Okoa spent much of her time extolling the virtues of this supposedly wonderful repatriation program. In fact, it is a complete fraud. Even Professor Okoa admitted, quote, it is true that few displaced persons have returned. The UN fact-finding mission explained why in its September 2018 report. While the Myanmar government has in principle committed to Rohingya repatriation, nothing thus far indicates this will be in a manner ensuring respect for human rights, essential for a safe, dignified, and sustainable return. The fact-finding report continues. On the contrary, Myanmar is making active efforts to prevent this return through the consolidation of the destruction of Rohingya villages, through appropriation of vacated land and terrain clearance, erasing every trace of the Rohingya communities, and the construction on this land of houses for other ethnic groups. This deplorable situation did not change as of the fact-finding mission's September 2019 report. Conditions in Myanmar are unsafe, unsustainable, and impossible for approximately one million displaced Rohingya to return to their homes and lands. The fact-finding report continues. The government is able, but unwilling, to change conditions and Rakhine state to ensure the Rohingya are able to enjoy all of their human rights. This is perhaps the strongest indication of why Rohingya justifiably insist that they are not prepared to return at this time. Professor Okoa claimed that Myanmar's lack of genocidal intent is proven by UNHCR's collaboration with the government on repatriation of displaced Rohingya. But she failed to quote from any of UNHCR's actual reports, including this one to the Security Council. Conditions are not yet conducive to the voluntary repatriation of Rohingya refugees. The causes of their flight have not been addressed, and we have yet to see substantive progress on addressing the exclusion and denial of rights that has deepened over the last decades, rooted in their lack of citizenship. Nor did she quote from this UNHCR report. UNHCR and UNDP, as was mentioned, have committed to helping Myanmar create conditions inside Rakhine State that would be conducive to the voluntary and sustainable return of refugees, meaning freedom of movement and a pathway to citizenship for those who remain. These conditions were stipulated in the MOU, but are not yet in place. We are still waiting for access to carry out our work. These conditions are still not in place, Mr. President. Senior Myanmar government and military officials refuse even to use the word Rohingya in order to preserve their racist myth that no such group 
exists. The court will have noted that the agent, as is her custom, refused to refer to the Muslims of her kind state as Rohingya. She uttered the word only in reciting the full formal name of the Arsa insurgent group. Myanmar's rejection of the Rohingya and its failure to carry out its commitments to UNHCR and UNDP demonstrate that it has no intention of allowing the displaced Rohingya to return. This is the view of Bangladesh, which Professor Okoa mistakenly depicted as having a favorable view of Myanmar's commitment to repatriation. On 9 June 2019, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued the following statement. The government of Myanmar failed to restore normalcy in northern Rakhine and make any visible progress in creating an environment conducive for return, which is an essential precondition for the commencement of repatriation. Other than making hollow promises, Myanmar has so far made hardly any progress in fulfilling its obligations. Professor Okoa misconstrues the willingness of Bangladesh and other states to promote repatriation of the Rohingya as endorsement of Myanmar's actions. China and Japan are to be commended for contributing to infrastructure and transportation to facilitate repatriation. And India, too, is to be applauded for its encouragement of repatriation. But it is up to Myanmar to create the conditions conducive for voluntary return. As UNHCR has repeatedly reminded it, and it has stubbornly refused to do so, as both UNHCR and the UN fact-finding mission have reported. And as a result, as even Myanmar's council admits, no significant repatriation has occurred. Reference was made to a commission headed by former Secretary General Kofi Annan, which presented a report in August 2017. It is of no assistance to Myanmar in these proceedings because as the UN fact-finding mission observed, the Annan Commission's mandate, quote, was focused on proposing concrete measures for improving the welfare of all people in Rakhine State. It was not mandated to investigate specific cases of alleged human rights violations. And it did not make any such investigation or finding. Mr. President, Myanmar has told us that its clearance operations were not aimed at destroying the Rohingya, but were actually intended, to quote the agent, quote, to clear an area of insurgents or terrorists by deliberately killing Rohingya children, slaughtered mercilessly by the Tatmadaw in these clearance operations. Many were infants beaten to death were torn from their mother's arms and thrown into a river to drown. How many of them were terrorists? By raping and gang raping and savagely mutilating women and girls? Is that indicative of fighting terrorism? Or of committing genocide against a hated group? by burning to the ground hundreds of villages and thousands of homes with entire families forced to remain inside? Where is the evidence that the Tatmadaw's clearance operations were primarily directed at insurgents or terrorists and not at the Rohingya population? There is very little. We have been told that the trigger for the 2017 clearance operation was an attack by ARSA on 25 August of that year. But contemporaneous reporting from Myanmar shows that the Tatmadaw deployed its notorious light infantry divisions to northern Rakhine State two weeks earlier, as of 11 August as reflected in this article in the Irrawaddy at tab 27, complete with photograph 
of arriving troops and quotes from senior military officers. The evidence is more consistent with Senior General Min Ong Hlaing's Facebook post that the troops were deployed because it was time to solve the Bengali problem once and for all. Mr. President, we do not contend that there were no insurgents or that Myanmar did not have the right to take military action against them. But we do contend that armed conflict can never be an excuse for genocide. As the UN fact-finding mission observed, regarding the Tatmadaw's conduct of these clearance operations, quote, there was not the least effort on their part to make any distinction between ARSA fighters and civilians, or to specifically target a military objective, or identify and repel an immediate threat. Everyone was a target, and no one was spared. Mothers, infants, pregnant women, the old and infirmed, all fell victim to this ruthless campaign. Professor Shabas helpfully confirmed that reports of fact-finding missions like this one may contain valuable information. However, he criticized the UN mission's conclusions in its September 2019 report that evidence of Myanmar's genocidal intentions had strengthened over the past year, on the ground that the mission did not mention, mention how or on what basis it reached that conclusion. He must have skipped over all the relevant paragraphs. Paragraph 9, for example, summarizes the evidence the mission considered in reaching its conclusion. It includes, quote, the government's hostile policies toward the Rohingya, including its continued denial of citizenship and ethnic identity, the living conditions to which it subjects them, its failure to reform laws that subjugate the Rohingya people, the continuation of hate speech directed at the Rohingya, its prior commission of genocide, and its disregard for accountability in relation to the clearance operations of 2016 and 2017. Much of the report consists of extensive details supporting all of these findings. Professor Shabas was also mistaken in asserting that there are no mass graves. To be sure, Myanmar has not made it easy to find them. It has systematically denied independent fact finders and human rights organizations, as well as journalists, access to areas of Rakhine State where its clearance operations were carried out. Nevertheless, the Associated Press located at least five mass graves of Rohingyas. The report is located at tab 28 of your judge's folders. Professor Okoa told you that the requirement of urgency is not met and that provisional measures should be denied because, allegedly, the decision to sue Myanmar was made in March 2019 and the application was not filed until November. She asked, somewhat sarcastically, it appeared, quote, was there something that happened in the interim that gave urgency to the request for provisional measures? The answer is yes. The submission of the UN fact-finding missions report in September 2019, which concluded that evidence of Myanmar's genocidal intent had strengthened in the past year and that, quote, there is a serious risk that genocidal actions may occur or recur. That prompted the Gambia to proceed as quickly as possible to retain counsel and file the application. I would also refer Professor Okoa to her colleague, Professor Zimmerman, who was listed as counsel to Myanmar in these proceedings. In his commentary on Article 41 of the court statute, he states, quote, 
Under the aspect of urgency, it is not relevant whether the situation complained of had already existed for a considerable time when the request was filed. For what is important is only the imminence of action prejudicial to the rights at stake. Mr. President, we demonstrated on Tuesday that there is an urgent need for provisional measures to prevent irreparable harm to the rights of the Gambia that are at issue in this case, and that the case for provisional measures here is among the most compelling that have ever been presented to the court. Nothing Myanmar said yesterday contradicts this. The fact-finding mission's conclusion that the only reasonable inference to be drawn from Myanmar's pattern of conduct is genocidal intent still stands. Indeed, as we have seen this morning, Myanmar either admits or fails to deny what the extensive evidence we submitted makes perfectly clear. There is an urgent need for provisional measures to prevent irreparable harm to the Gambia's rights as a state party to the Genocide Convention. Mr. President, members of the court, this concludes my presentation. I thank you again for your kind courtesy and patient attention, and I ask that you call my colleague, Professor Darjan, to the podium. I thank Mr. Reichel for his statement. I'll now give the floor to Professor Bir Darjan. You have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le thank you, President. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, members of the court, it falls to me to respond to the arguments presented yesterday by Mr. Staker around the theme of your prima facie uh, jurisdiction. Mr. Staker uh, argued that Gambia had acted, and I quote, as a proxy for an international organization, and that Gambia called upon the court not as a state party to the convention, but in its capacity as president of the ad hoc ministerial committee of the OIC, that is to say, as a body of of this international organization. Mr. Staker inferred that your rationale personae jurisdiction was lacking and therefore thinking otherwise would be tantamount to circumventing the requirements of Article 34 of the status, uh, statute. Uh, this uh, proposal disregarded reality. It is indeed Gambia that uh, suggested uh, that the OIC adopt the resolution 59 slash 45 of May 2018. It is not the OIC that mandated Gambia. It is Gambia that sought uh, within the OIC the support of its member states, and that is assuredly its right. Similarly, nothing prevents Gambia to receive financial support from other states. Uh, furthermore, Mr. Staker found, was in a situation of legal contradiction because he said both uh, that Gambia would have acted as a body of the OIC and as a proxy. Of course, in law, uh, it could be a situation of either or, but in reality, it was in fact neither nor. Uh, the fact uh, that the uh, presidency of the ad hoc ministerial committee came back to Gambia due to its initiative does not transform Gambia into a body or agent of the OIC. And in fact, it is not in this capacity that Gambia called upon the court. Uh, in fact, Gambia submitted uh, its uh, application instituting proceedings, uh, and this uh, legal act is undeniably attributed to Gambia as a member state of the United St uh, Nations and therefore bound by the statute of the court and having access to it. Uh, the agent of the Gambia who signed the application is the Minister of Justice. Uh, uh, he is the body of the country and was not at the, the disposal of the OIC and acted uh, under uh, or did not act under the official control of this organization or as a proxy. Um, no uh, document uh, having uh, been submitted uh, uh, supports uh, uh, that uh, the OIC uh, gave mandates to one of its members uh, in the present case. Uh, the member states of the OIC, in fact, only encouraged Gambia to act uh, before the court. Uh, there is no, uh, therefore, proof of, uh, of 
uh, the article, Article 34, being circumvented. Uh, um, uh, and uh, um, well, it, it's just that uh, the 56 uh, other states uh, encouraged uh, Gambia, uh, uh, and uh, there is no uh, proof of circumventing the article, uh, even if they all belong to the same organizations. And in this respect, it is irrelevant that 13 of the 57 member states of the OIC uh, were not bound by the convention uh, and its uh, Article 9. The proceedings uh, pertaining to the application of 11th November are between Gambia and Myanmar. And uh, um, the uh, dispute, therefore, uh, uh, is indeed a dispute uh, between uh, Gambia and Myanmar and not between OIC and Myanmar. Mr. Uh, Staker recycled his uh, ratione persone argument uh, when uh, the examination of the ratione material jurisdiction of the court was examined. Uh, uh, but for the same reasons, it must be rejected. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Staker uh, claimed that no dispute uh, uh, existed between the parties before the 11th of November 2019. Uh, uh, that is uh, the day that the application was sub submitted. Uh, um, but my colleague, Mr. Suleiman, uh, clearly explained that a dispute did exist before the seizing of the court. Uh, Mr. Staker first argues that the OIC resolutions are irrelevant to establish uh, the prior existence of a dispute because Myanmar is not a member and that these resolutions do not contain any positive uh, affirmation according to which Myanmar would have violated the convention, uh, whereas uh, based on the Marshall Islands case, uh, he uh, questioned the significance uh, of Gambia's positive vote. The fact that Myanmar is not a member of the OIC is irrelevant uh, because these resolutions were brought to its knowledge uh, and Myanmar did not uh, refute that because it reacted to them. Uh, furthermore, these resolutions explicitly target Myanmar and the situation of the Rohingyas uh, whilst uh, they refer to the need to prevent genocide, uh, such as notably the case of uh, the May 2018 resolution that created the Ad Hoc Ministerial Committee. Resolution 4, uh, stroke 46 of March 2019, uh, which was not annexed to the file that Myanmar submitted to you yesterday, but uh, was covered in the, the application and was annexed to uh, the observations of Gambia, calls on Myanmar to honor its uh, obligations, uh, and I quote, under international law and human rights covenants, and to take all necessary measures to immediately halt all vestiges and manifestations of genocide against Rohingya Muslims, unquote. I doubt that uh, one can be any clearer in diplomatic language. Uh, um, uh, why ask for the fulfillment of obligations uh, if they hadn't been violated at all to begin with? Uh, as to the vote of Gambia to support the resolutions, uh, may I recall uh, uh, that they did not contain the, uh, a, whole, uh, a host of different proposals, uh, but they were based on a single theme, and hence the meaning of these voting patterns is crystal clear. Mr. Seiko also uh, said that the fact-finding missions uh, reports uh, could serve as a basis to identify um, prior dispute between Gambia and Myanmar. Gambia is not an author of these reports, uh, but it is indisputable that uh, welcoming uh, the fact that Gambia wanted to refer the current dispute to your jurisdiction uh, um, means that the UN report uh, had necessarily notified Myanmar, uh, particularly since the respondent uh, um, uh, rejected the report. So Myanmar couldn't possibly have not been aware of the dispute. Um, Mr. Staker considered that the uh, declaration of Gambia at the UN General Assembly was irrelevant because the Gambian Vice President uh, failed to specifically mention the Genocide Convention. The Gambian Declaration uh, dates back to the 26th of September, that is to say, 10 days after the Fact-Finding Missions report uh, referring explicitly to the Genocide Convention and welcoming the intention of Gambia uh, uh, to bring the dispute before the court and three days before it was categorically rejected by Myanmar. Does Mr. Staker seriously argue that uh, Myanmar uh, could have legitimately thought uh, that the object of the dispute that Gambia uh, was bringing before the court could have changed completely in a matter of just a few days? 
As to the uh, Gambian note verbal of the 11th of October 2019, Mr. Staker made several objections but did not deny the fact that Man- Myanmar had received it. According to Mr. Staker, the uh, note verbal did not require any answer because it did not specify any particular fact supporting the charges that it contained. Mr. Staker is clearly mistaking the requirements of Article 38 of the rules pertaining to content of an application with the simple need to point out before the application that the parties are in disagreement in regard to certain international obligations. Furthermore, inasmuch as uh, contrary to other compromissory clauses, Article 9 of the Convention does not subject the jurisdiction of the Court uh, to the existence of pre-existing obligations, the requirements uh, pointed out by Mr. Saker are simply without basis. The Court may do well to contrast uh, the submission by Mr. Baker, whereby Myanmar uh, doubtlessly did respond to the note verbal by Gambia if it had been more elaborate, or would have responded rather, uh, with the attitude of Myanmar when the report uh, was uh, submitted, that is to say, the report of the fact-finding mission. This uh, simple fact allows the court uh, to reject the assertion whereby that the month went by uh, between the not verbal and the application and that this allowed Myanmar to uh, take a position. The respondent state had a month, uh, actually only 13 days, to reject a sentence in a report containing 190 pages on 16 September. Mr. Staker uh, maybe could enlighten the court as to the proper amount of time that, in his view, a state accused of genocide would have to wait before uh, responding to such an accusation that has already several times been rejected. Mr. Staker has also uh, questioned the reason whereby the not verbal was sent a week after Gambia procured the services of legal counsel and not before, and he reaches the conclusion that the not verbal was a mere legal formality. If by legal formality Mr. Staker is referring to the action confirming the existence of a dispute, then he has correctly identified the nature of the note verbal of 11 October, unless he considers that Myanmar's silence is tantamount to consenting of responsibility. He is simply confirming the existence of a dispute between the parties under the uh, convention uh, and before being uh, presented to the court. Well, before he contested the plausibility of rights under litigation, uh, which uh, Gambia requests uh, uh, protection for, uh, Myanmar expected this more than a month before. Mr. President, whereas Mr. Shabazz contested the plausibility of the uh, the plausibility of the claims, which is uh, distinct from a subject from the one I am addressing. My colleague will be addressing that. He addressed the plausibility of claims. Mr. Staker, however, did not contest the plausibility of the rights uh, which uh, Gambia is requesting the protection for. He nevertheless considered that uh, instead of maybe there being wrongdoing in these actions, Gambia may have not have standing in this procedure. Uh, Mr. Staker did not contest uh, that Gambia had the right uh, to uh, invoke uh, Myanmar's responsibility as a state other than a wronged party under Article 48 and the Articles on International Responsibilities of States. However, he did consider that uh, the invoking of such responsibility could not be done only under international relations, but not before a judge. He also said that the Belgium-Senegal case should be distinguished from this case because in that case, Belgium would have been a uh, a state that was subject of wrongdoing. Uh, But he separated this from Axio Populares. On this last point, Professor Sands will be responding to Mr. Staker, and I will thus limit myself to several observations on the alleged lack of standing. In referring to the judgment uh, Belgium uh, vs. Senegal, Mr. Baker did not explain the reason whereby the court first did not consider it necessary to identify whether Belgium had been affected, and secondly, 
where the court affirmed in general terms that vis-a-vis -vis erga omnes partis obligations, the requirement of a specific interest would have as a consequence that no state would, in most cases, be able to present a claim against the state that had actually committed a wrongful act. As to the distinction between claiming responsibility in the context of international relations or before the court, this distinction per appears to be particularly obscure and unjustified. Invoking responsibility before a judge in diplomatic relations is always intended to assert a breach of law. The distinction suggested by uh, Mr. Staker does not appear in the work of the International Law Commission, and it is also contradicted by the Inst Institute for International Law when a jurisdictional uh, link appears between the parties. Mr. Staker has also stated that the application for provisional measures is contrary to Article 41 of the statute and that it aims at preserving each party's rights. He did not uh, make any explanations to this effect and did not contest uh, that this language aims all rights under litigation before a judge. Finally, Mr. Staker says that uh, through its uh, reservation on Article 8 of the Convention, Burma was not, uh, uh, or the court rather, could not be seized uh, and its jurisdiction could not be invoked. Because of the fact that Myanmar did not accept Article 8 of the Convention, no uh, party then could uh, bring a claim before the court, whereas according to the respondent, uh, this article does give the court jurisdiction because of the consent to Article 9. Myanmar empties Article 9 of its meaning and provides no explanation as to what its meaning could then be at this uh, preliminary stage where its jurisdiction must be ascertained uh, prima facie. So at this uh, stage, the court uh, should uh, uh, not uh, consider this uh, argument because it is a considerable departure from the good faith uh, uh, with uh, any interpretation that uh, should be made of this treaty. Mr. President, I would now like to request uh, that you uh, listen to Professor Philip Sands. Thank you very much. Je remercie le professeur d'argent pour sa présentation. Thank you very much uh, uh, to Mr. Pierre d'argent for his um, oral statement. I'd like to give the floor now to Professor Stan Sands. You have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président, Madame Vice-Présidente de la Cour. Thank you, Mr. President. A Myanmar in the first round in six points. And I have to say at the outset, it was hard not to be struck by Myanmar's first round arguments, a sort of back to the future of legal submissions. My first point. Mr. Staker addressed the court at length on the issue of legal interest and standing. His position, in short, was that the Gambia has no legal interest in the question of whether Myanmar is treating its citizens in accordance with the requirements of the 1948 Convention. He cited numerous cases in support of that contention, but there was one that he did not mention. As he addressed the court in dulcet Australian tones, I shut my eyes and suddenly wondered if I wasn't hearing the voice of Sir Percy Spender back in 1966, as he explained why he cast the decisive president's vote in favor of the court's conclusion. You will recall that decision, that Ethiopia and Liberia, and I quote, cannot be considered to have established any legal right or interest appertaining to them in the subject matter of the present claims, end of quote. Namely, the question of whether South Africa was treating the inhabitants of the territory of Southwest Africa in accordance with obligations incumbent upon it under international law. That judgment caused a scandal. It cast the court into a wilderness for nearly two decades. And this court could, I suppose, 
if it wishes, rule that Gambia has no legal interest in the case. But you will surely be aware that to take that approach will cast the court into an incomparably more bleak wilderness, given that the overwhelming majority of the members of the United Nations, having endorsed the reports of the UN fact-finding mission and other UN-supported activities, will be truly shocked if this court, 53 years after Southwest Africa, declines to indicate provisional measures in this case. But of course, we trust that that will not be the case. Indeed, I can direct Mr. Staker's attention to a paragraph of that dismal judgment. Paragraph 66. Even Sir Percy Spender, even Sir Percy Spender was willing to accept that if Ethiopia and Liberia had been parties to a treaty to which South Africa was also a party, which provided basic rights for the inhabitants of Southwest Africa, they would have had standing. Substantive rights, the court ruled, and I quote, may be derived from participation in an international instrument by a state which has signed and ratified or has acceded or has in some other manner become a party to it, and which in consequence and subject to any exceptions expressly indicated, is entitled to enjoy rights under all the provisions of the instrument concerned." End of quote. In the Southwest Africa case, back in 1966, the three countries were not all parties to an international instrument like the Genocide Convention. And hence, Sir Percy ruled, they didn't have legal standing. By contrast, the Gambia is a party to such a treaty, and so is Myanmar. The Gambia has a legal interest, and it has legal standing. My second point, the conditions governing an order for provisional measures. Mr. Staker asserted that on the facts before you, the claim that a genocide has occurred is not plausible. Indeed, he went on, it is so manifestly lacking that the case shouldn't even be inscribed on the court's list. Reject the application in limine, he basically said. He followed the submissions of Professor Shabas, who made much of the court's jurisprudence on proving genocidal intent. Understandably, he took you to paragraph 510 of the court's merits judgment in the Croatia case. This states that, and I quote, for a pattern of conduct to be accepted as evidence of genocidal intent, it would have to be such that it could only point to the existence of such intent. That is to say, that it can only reasonably be understood as reflecting that intent. Let me be clear. The Gambia's application is based squarely on that standard. So are the conclusions of the fact-finding mission and of the Special Rapporteur and of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Professor Shabas said the question you must ask yourselves at this preliminary phase is, and I quote, whether it is plausible that genocide intent is the only inference that can be drawn, end of quote. It's a reasonable question, provided, of course, that the question is posed in relation to some of the acts alleged, but not necessarily all of them. After all, it is possible for some acts to be characterized as genocidal, such as rape and killing, while others are characterized as crimes against humanity such as the forcible displacement of human beings or their deportation. If the answer to the question posed by Professor Shabas is yes, in relation to some of the acts that are before you, then you order provisional measures. Moreover, the fact that it is also plausible 
that another inference could be drawn in relation to those acts does not mean that you cannot order provisional measures. Plausibility is not a zero-sum game. The plausibility of one explanation does not exclude the plausibility of another. Two explanations can be simultaneously plausible. That's a difference between the provisional measures phase and the merits phase. Professor Schabus' attempt to create a new and onerous legal standard at the provisional measures stage, one that imports the test that applies at the merits stage, has no legal basis. Indeed, neither Professor Schabus nor any of Myanmar's other counsel addressed the obligation on Myanmar to prevent genocide under Article 1 and how that interacts with the findings of genocidal intent. As this court is well aware, Myanmar is not only under an obligation not to commit genocide, but also to prevent it, a duty which arises, and I quote, at the instant that the state learns of, or should normally have learned of, the existence of a serious risk that genocide will be committed, end of quote. UN fact-finding mission reports amply demonstrate the existence of a serious risk. Can this court really conclude otherwise? That seems, frankly, a bit of a stretch, one that would be manifestly inconsistent with the obligation to prevent, an obligation that arises from the first moment of awareness. Yet Professor Schabus tells you that now, today, next week, and thereafter, you are required to apply a standard that requires a conclusive finding of solely genocidal intent simply to be able to order provisional measures. In short, the test at this stage is not whether genocidal intent is the only plausible inference to be drawn, as Professor Schabus argues. If that was the test, it would be hard to see how this court could ever order provisional measures under the Genocide Convention in relation to Article 1, since such a conclusion can hardly be reached without descending deeply into the merits. And that is something the parties agree this court cannot do at this stage. The court did not apply that test back in 1993 in the Bosnia case, although it seems that Myanmar wants you to abandon the approach it then adopted. The thrust of the convention in this court's statute is to require you to act protectively, to err on the side of caution. If it is plausible that a finding of genocide might be made on the basis of the evidence and material that is before you, then you have to order provisional measures. If it is not plausible, then you don't. Given the reports that are on the record, we don't see how this court can possibly conclude that genocidal intent is to be excluded. The agent for Myanmar told you that, and I quote, invoking the 1948 Genocide Convention is a matter of utmost gravity, end of quote. Indeed it is. States do not lightly invoke or allege genocide. The fact that 56 members of the OIC have decided to lend their support to this case, along with Canada and the Netherlands, and more will no doubt surely follow, speaks clearly as to the gravity of the current situation. It strengthens the case for provisional measures rather than weakens it, exactly contrary to Myanmar's argument. It is equally telling that a United States federal institution, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, with a board of trustees that includes four members of the US Senate and five members of the US House of Representatives, has found, and I quote, compelling evidence that the Burmese military committed ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, and genocide against the Rohingya, end of quote. 
An institution like this, a venerable institution, does not tend to make public statements that are easily characterized as implausible. Nor, might I add, does Professor Shabas, at least when he's speaking in an academic capacity, rather than as counsel for Myanmar. Let us look at what he told Al Jazeera back in 2013 about the term genocide. And I quote, we're moving into a zone where the word can be used in the case of the Rohingya. When you see measures preventing births, trying to deny the identity of the people, hoping to see that they really are eventually, that they no longer exist, denying their history, denying the legitimacy of the right to live where they live, these are all warning signs that mean that it is not frivolous to envisage the use of the term genocide. End of quote. Now, you can watch him on video for yourself. It is publicly available on the web, and the citation is in the footnotes to this speech. Of course, everyone is allowed to change their mind. But the obvious question is, how could that which was not frivolous in 2013, before the clearance operations, before the killings, before the rapes, somehow become implausible in 2019. The path to implausibility is eased, of course, if you simply take certain categories of acts out of the equation. Myanmar has been conspicuously silent, for example, about all the sexual violence that has occurred on a wide and systematic basis. A clear reflection, we say, as do the UN bodies that have considered the matter, of genocidal intent. Yet the word rape, rape, did not once pass the lips of the agent or of any of Myanmar's counsel. There was no commitment to cooperate with UN bodies, no commitment to investigate this crime on its own account, no commitment to prosecute. We heard much from Myanmar's agent about the vital importance of domestic accountability, but not a word, not a word about the women and the girls of her country, Myanmar, who have been subjected to these awful serial violations. Madam Agent, your silence said far more than your words. I turn briefly to another point made by Myanmar, the third of my points. You were taken to the recent decision of the ICC pretrial chamber to authorize an investigation of the deportation of Rohingya from Myanmar to Bangladesh as a crime against humanity, not genocide. You see, Council suggested, how can it possibly be a genocide if the ICC hasn't said it's a genocide? Well, the explanation is rather prosaic. Myanmar is not a party to the statute of the ICC, but Bangladesh is. And the ICC's jurisdiction only extends to acts occurring on the territory of a state party. No element of the crime of genocide has been committed on the territory of a state party. No element of the crime of genocide has been committed on the territory, sorry, no element of the crime of genocide has been committed on the territory of Bangladesh. The crime of deportation, however, which is a crime against humanity, might have been committed on the territory of Bangladesh as it is a transboundary crime. It is in no way inconsistent with the existence of a genocidal intent in respect of other acts. Indeed, the ICTY genocide cases relating to Srebrenica 
all also included the crime against humanity of deportation, and Professor Shabas is well aware of their coexistence. Such coexistence of distinct crimes is readily recognized in the jurisprudence of the ICTY, the ICTR, and the ICC. Myanmar suggested that the observations of various bodies, including the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the UN Human Rights Council, that there is ethnic cleansing in Rakhine somehow precludes the plausibility of a simultaneous finding of genocide. That suggestion is wrong in fact and in law. As this court made clear in its Bosnia versus Serbia judgment, it is clear that acts of ethnic cleansing may occur in parallel to acts prohibited by Article 2 of the Convention and may be significant as indicative of the presence of a specific intent, dolus specialis, inspiring those acts. In 2015, the court reaffirmed in its Croatia versus Serbia judgment that, and I quote, acts of ethnic cleansing can indeed be elements in the implementation of a genocidal plan, end of quote. My fourth point, Myanmar made a number of claims about the 1993 orders in the Bosnia case, presumably in response to our argument that those orders are instructive and offer an appropriate starting point for what the court should do in this case. It seems that Myanmar doesn't like the 1993 orders very much. Mr. Staker told you that they were merely a 26-year-old precedent and that they predate the court's important ruling on binding provisional measures in La Grande. But he seems to have missed paragraph 452 of your 2007 Bosnia judgment, where the court stated explicitly that the fact that the 1993 orders predated La Grande, and I quote, does not affect the binding nature of those orders, end of quote, which, I quote, created legal obligations which both parties were required to satisfy, end of quote. Mr. Staker also submitted that the 1993 orders were, in effect, useless, which is my fifth point. Provisional measures in such terms serve no useful purpose, he told you. We are grateful to him for reinforcing the point we made on Tuesday when I reminded you that the 1993 orders failed to prevent the genocide at Srebrenica two years later. Provisional measures worded in such broad terms, Mr. Staker explained, make it impossible to know what the precise conduct might be within provisional measures. We agree. The court must go further on the first and second provisional measures and specify with as much precision as possible and on the basis of what has already occurred the kind of acts that Myanmar must refrain from and prevent. Indeed, to the list we have already provided to you, we would have no objection if you added the acts identified by Professor Shabas in his 2013 interview, like the prevention of births, the right to live where you live, and the denial of the identity of the Rohingya people. On the last point, we noted that the agent said that, and I quote, all children born in Rakhine, regardless of religious background, are issued with birth certificates, end quote. Notwithstanding the UN fact-finding mission's conclusion that this has not been the case, the agent's comment seems to imply, at the very least, a recognition that the Rohingya are human beings, which seems like a concession. But she did not recognize their right to citizenship. And, as you will have noted, and Mr. Reichler reminded you, did not feel able to mention the word Rohingya. 
We noted, incidentally, that the agent, like her counsel, passed in total silence over the genocide at Srebrenica, one recognised by this court. Perhaps this was because the numbers killed, 8,000, are, in the view of Myanmar, simply too small to merit recognition. After all, as Professor Shabas put it in the case of the Rohingya, and I quote, 10,000 deaths out of a population of well over one million might suggest something other than an intent to physically destroy the group, end of quote. But genocide is not just a numbers game, Mr. President. And the convention makes clear that the intention to destroy a group in part is sufficient. You have evidence before you that entire Rohingya villages have been destroyed, and most, if not all, of the inhabitants have been killed. There is ample authority in the jurisprudence on genocide to support the view that such destruction of an entire community in a limited geographic area on grounds of ethnicity or religion or race, and even where it is not the whole protected group, can properly be characterized as an act of genocide. My sixth submission concerns the other provisional measures we've requested, on which Myanmar had very little to say. On the third measure, they wondered what evidence related to the events described in the application might mean. With respect, Myanmar is assisted by a team of experienced international counsel who can advise them on exactly what this means. It starts with the preservation of mass graves, the preservation of bodies of victims, and the preservation of destroyed villages. And it continues to all the other evidence which presumably is of the kind Myanmar now says it will be gathering for the investigations which they have told the court they are committed to undertaking. The fourth provisional measure, not aggravating or extending the dispute, is standard in the practice of this court. Again, if Myanmar is in doubt, it can obtain advice from its experienced counsel. The fifth provisional measure would impose a reporting requirement. And as Mr. Staker well knows, it is not intended to create some sort of human rights monitoring machinery. It simply requires the parties to inform the court as to the steps they are taking to give effect to the provisional measures orders indicated by the court. This is routine, for example, in matters relating to the law of the sea, which, while of very great importance, cannot be said to be as grave as the issues that arise in this case. If reporting is good enough for the law of the sea, it's certainly good enough for this case. As to the sixth provisional measure, we say it's proper and appropriate for a number of compelling reasons. First, it is intrinsically linked to the obligation under Article 1 of the Genocide Convention to prevent and punish genocide. Effective investigation and the preservation of evidence are fundamental to preventing impunity for genocide and thus complying with the Article 1 obligation. Yet the consistent picture before the court is that Myanmar is refusing to cooperate with or provide access to investigative bodies to collect evidence, thereby creating a material impediment to the eventual punishment of genocide, and that it is itself destroying evidence, including by bulldozing destroyed Rohingya villages. Since Myanmar has proved itself to be unwilling to investigate what has occurred in any real sense, it is only by ordering it to cooperate with independent UN investigators, currently in the form of the independent investigative mechanism, that this court might be able to assure itself that the Gambia's right to have other parties to the convention comply with their Article I obligation will be protected pending the resolution of this case. Second, the sixth provisional measure is consistent with the jurisprudence of the court. It builds on the order that was made, for example, in the frontier dispute case. The parties should refrain from any act 
likely to impede the gathering of evidence material to the present case. Myanmar's persistent refusal to cooperate with UN fact-finding mission has already impeded the gathering of evidence material to the present case. And it's only by indicating the requested provisional measures that further impediment can be avoided. The requested measure is not, as I've said, novel. It's the same in substance as the order made in the Frontier Dispute case, adapt to the specific circumstances pertaining to this case. Further, it is directly linked to the Article 41 requirement of preserving the respective rights of the parties. It is necessary to preserve the integrity of these proceedings and the Gambia's right to have its claim fairly adjudicated because this claim will in due course depend on the evidence that can be collected. Myanmar's non-cooperation with international investigative bodies threatens that right, and a provisional measure in the form requested is necessary in order to protect it. Mr. President, members of the court, I will conclude. As I mentioned in my first round statement, genocide is not a single act. From its very genesis, it has been recognized to be a continuum. That was the only point I made in invoking the spirit of Dr. Lemkin. And it is comprised of different actions, which individually and together, and over stages and time, amount to this most heinous crime. With genocide, one thing always leads to another. That was the point of invoking the spirit of Primo Levi. The situation the court is confronted with today is a delicate one. Unlike in the Bosnia case, there is no international criminal tribunal with special responsibility for the crimes committed in this case. Today, the hopes of the Gambia and of the Rohingya people, some of whom are in the Great Hall today, rest entirely with you to exercise the power vested in you by Article 41 of the statute and to grant specific protective provisional measures to interrupt and prevent the continuum of genocide, to break the chain that has already occurred and is continuing to occur today in Rakhine. Myanmar urges you to take a different path. Peace and harmony is best assured by doing nothing, the agent told you yesterday. Forget about the 1993 orders, council said yesterday. They're useless. Go back to the glory days of 1966 and the Southwest Africa judgment. Council, in effect, pleaded, but not its paragraph 66. And forget about the Genocide Convention of 1948. Just give Myanmar the space and the freedom to act, unfettered by the unfortunate distraction that is international law. Perhaps, perhaps, some of you might be tempted to do that. But we trust that the court will exercise its judicial function that it will apply the law, that it will give effect to the requirements that the drafters of the 1948 Convention entrusted upon you, and that you will not abdicate your judicial functions and responsibilities. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, members of the court, the eyes of the world, of individuals and of groups, of countries and of United Nations bodies are upon this court. That concludes my submissions. I'd like to express my thanks to all my colleagues for their assistance. In particular, Ms. Jessica Jones, I thank you for your kind and patient attention and invite you to ask the agent of the Gambia to the bar. I thank Professor Sands, and I shall now give the floor to the agent of the Gambia, His Excellency, Mr. Abu Bakr Mari Tambadu. You have the floor, sir.
Mr. President, Honorable Judges, it is an honor to address you once again as the agent of the Republic of the Gambia. As you heard on Tuesday and this morning, the situation of the Rohingya in Myanmar is dire. The evidence from various United Nations bodies and independent human rights organizations clearly establishes the urgent and imminent risk of the recurrence of genocide that they face. The lives of these human beings are at risk. The Gambia may not be a neighboring state, but the Gambia has a keen and special interest in seeing that no group of people, including the Rohingya, suffer genocide. As a state party to the Genocide Convention, the Gambia has come to this court to protect its rights under the Convention to ensure that the Erga Omnes Party's obligations undertaken by Myanmar under the Convention are fulfilled. Those obligations, not to commit genocide and to prevent and punish genocide, are owed to the Gambia and indeed to all other state parties to the Convention. Mr. President, honorable judges, the Gambia has been open about its dispute with Myanmar. We openly raised this dispute at successive sessions of the United Nations General Assembly. We have openly welcomed support for this effort from other states, including member states of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Indeed, it was from beginning to end the Gambia's initiative to table resolutions and form a committee and seek the broader support of the other 56 member states of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. The Gambia is proud to have the diplomatic and political support of the other 56 member states of the OIC and of other supportive states like Canada and the Netherlands, as the Gambia, in its sovereign capacity, pursues this case against Myanmar. It was the Gambia alone that sent the note verbal to Myanmar to clearly spell out the nature of this dispute and put Myanmar on notice. And it was the Gambia alone that has filed the application and request for provisional measures that is now before the court. Mr. President, honorable judges, the Gambia's request for provisional measures falls squarely within the Genocide Convention. We have shown that the rights of the Gambia that we are seeking to protect are plausibly connected to the measures requested. And we have amply demonstrated urgency and risk of irreparable harm. The Gambia urges this court as the guardians of our moral and legal compass under the Convention to indicate the requested provisional measures. Mr. President, I shall now read out the Gambia's final submissions. Pursuant to Article 41 of the Statute of the Court, the Gambia, as a state party to the Genocide Convention, respectfully requests the Court as a matter of extreme urgency to indicate the following provisional measures, which are directly linked 
to the rights that form the subject matter of this dispute, pending its determination of this case on the merits. A. Myanmar shall immediately, in pursuance of its undertaking in the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of 9 December 1948, take all measures within its power to prevent all acts that amount or contribute to the crime of genocide, including taking all measures within its power to prevent the following acts from being committed against any member of the Rohingya group. Extrajudicial killings or physical abuse, rape or other forms of sexual violence, burning of homes or villages, destruction of lands and livestock, deprivation of food and other necessities of life, or any other deliberate infliction of conditions of life calculated to bring about the physical destruction of the Rohingya group in whole or in part. B, Myanmar shall, in particular, ensure that any military paramilitary or irregular armed units which may be directed or supported by it, as well as any organizations and persons which may be subject to its control, direction or influence, do not commit any act of genocide, of conspiracy to commit genocide, or direct and public incitement to commit genocide, or indeed of complicity in genocide against the Rohingya group, including extrajudicial killings or physical abuse, rape or other forms of sexual violence, burning of homes or villages, destruction of lands and livestock, deprivation of food and other necessities of life, or any other deliberate infliction of conditions of life calculated to bring about the physical destruction of the Rohingya group in whole or in part. C. Myanmar shall not destroy or render inaccessible any evidence related to the events described in the application, including or without limitation, by destroying or rendering inaccessible the remains of any member of the Rohingya group who is a victim of alleged genocidal acts, or altering the physical locations where such acts are alleged to have occurred in such a manner as to render the evidence of such acts, if any, inaccessible. D, Myanmar and the Gambia shall not take any action and shall assure that no action is taken which may aggravate or extend the existing dispute that is the subject of this application or render it more difficult of resolution. E. Myanmar and the Gambia shall each provide a report to the court on all measures taken to give effect to this order for provisional measures no later than four months from its issuance. And F. Myanmar shall grant access to and cooperate with all United Nations fact-finding bodies that are engaged in investigating alleged genocidal acts against the Rohingya, including the conditions to which the Rohingya are subjected. Mr. President, honorable judges, 
This concludes the Gambia's second round of observations. I wish to take this opportunity to thank you once again for your kind attention. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank all members of the registry, the court staff and security, and the interpreters for their dedicated work throughout the hearings. I thank you. And with your permission, Mr. President, I would like to take my seat. You have my permission. I thank the agent of the Gambia. The court takes note of the provisional measures requested by the Gambia that you have just read out on behalf of your government. The court will meet again this afternoon at 4.30 p.m. to hear the second round of oral observations of Myanmar. The sitting is adjourned. Please be seated. The sitting is open. The court meets this afternoon to hear the second round of oral observations of Myanmar on the request for the indication of provisional measures by the Gambia. I shall now give the floor to Mr. Staker. You have the floor. Mr. President, members of the court, I will respond to the points made by counsel for the Gambia this morning in relation to issues of prima facie jurisdiction and prima facie standing and the form of the provisional measures requested. The first sub-issue of prima facie jurisdiction relates to the matter of the Gambia acting in these proceedings as a proxy or organ of an international organization rather than in its capacity as a state party to the Genocide Convention. We made the point during the first round that these proceedings are brought on behalf of and are funded by the OIC. One thing we do find striking is that it's funding. Yesterday I said that it is unknown 
which states have donated what to the voluntary fund, or whether the donors are even confined to states. This morning might have been an opportunity for the Gambia to provide some transparency in that respect, but there was complete silence. Not only do we still not know precise amounts contributed by individual donors, we do not even know if the donors include non-state entities such as international organizations, NGOs, or even private individuals. We do not even know if the Gambia is spending a single penny of its own resources on these proceedings. It's accepted that the Gambia signed the application instituting proceedings in its own name. However, it's clear from the documents I took you to yesterday that these proceedings are brought on behalf of the OIC and that the proceedings are financed by an OIC-controlled fund. I will not take you to all that evidence again. The situation is expressed particularly clearly in the 24 November OIC press release at tab 3.17 of the judges folder. It states in terms that the Gambia, as chair of the ad hoc OIC committee, has been tasked with submitting the case to the ICJ following a decision by the OIC heads of state. The meaning is plain. The decision to bring these proceedings was brought by the OIC heads of state, and the OIC tasked the Gambia to bring them. The Gambia was so tasked in its capacity as chair of the ad hoc committee. The fact that the Gambia brings these proceedings on behalf of the OIC has been announced in official OIC documents, statements made by the Gambia in the General Assembly, and by the law firm representing the Gambia in these proceedings, as well as in the media. The Gambia may now claim otherwise, but this is a bare assertion that is contradicted by the evidence. It may well be that there is more to the background to the adoption of these OIC resolutions than Myanmar can know. If so, explanations and evidence could have been provided by the Gambia, which, unlike Myanmar, was a party to the various developments within the OIC relating to this matter. It has provided none, and in the circumstances, the court can only base its decision on the evidence before it. I would finally note in this respect that the Gambia did not argue today that it would be legitimate for it to bring these proceedings on behalf of the OIC. The Gambia seems to concede that point. The second sub-issue of prima facie jurisdiction concerns the existence of a dispute. Mr. Daljean claimed this morning that the various OIC resolutions made clear to the Gambia that there was a dispute with Myanmar under the Genocide Convention. I do not need to repeat all that I said yesterday. They do not. Mr. Daljean referred this morning to the March 2019 OIC Resolution 4-46-MM on the situation of the Muslim community in Myanmar. However, that resolution also does not mention specifically the Genocide Convention. It contains general references to genocide, as well as, for instance, crimes against humanity, but as I submitted yesterday, this court has no jurisdiction in this case over violations of customary international law aspects of genocide. The OIC resolution does not identify a dispute concerning the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the Genocide Convention within the meaning 
of Article 9. I therefore maintain the position that the 11 October note verbal did not call for a response, either at all or in any event within a month. Mr. President, members of the court, I then turn to the issue of standing. Counsel for the Gambia once again blurs the crucial difference between the right to invoke another state's responsibility and the question whether a state has standing before this court. This difference is important uh, and um, as the general right to invoke another state's responsibility under customary international law is much broader, given that the question of standing before this court is clearly regulated by this court's statute and its established jurisprudence. Let me recall that the IOC's then special rapporteur himself considered that what is now Article 48 of the ILC's draft articles on state responsibility was in many parts no codification of the Lex Lata, but merely constituted a progressive development of international law. Secondly, the ILC has made it clear that Article 48 of the draft articles was without prejudice to the general principle that the implementation of state responsibility is in first place an entitlement of the injured state. Or as the ILC's former special rapporteur on the matter put it in unequivocal terms, the priority of specially affected states ought to be recognized when it comes to reactions to violations of erga omnes norms. The progressive development provided for in Article 48, Paragraph 2 of the ILC's Articles on State Responsibility was thus merely intended to ensure that where there is no state at all that is individually injured, some third entity is available to invoke the responsibility of the violating state in the interest of the beneficiaries of that obligation breached. However, in cases like the one before you now, in which there is, a, there is a specifically affected state, namely Bangladesh, a finding which the applicant did not rebut this morning, um, it is that especially affected state that has the right to invoke the responsibility of the state that has allegedly breached its obligations. In such a situation, it is neither necessary nor indeed desirable that any other state should then be able to invoke such responsibility as well. Therefore, our submission is not that a non-injured state was generally barred in any conceivable situation from bringing a claim before this court. Rather, we submit that it's not possible to circumvent the principle that it's the right of an injured state to decide if and eventually how to invoke the responsibility of another state and that the right of non-injured states to invoke such responsibility is subsidiary. This is also highlighted by Article 45 of the ILC's Articles on State Responsibility. According to Article 5 of the ILC Articles on State Responsibility, no state may invoke state responsibility if the injured state has either waived its claim or acquiesced in the lapse of the claim. We submit that the same must hold true when the specially affected state has, by entering a reservation to Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, waived its right to vindicate the responsibility of the alleged wrongdoer before the court. Mr. President, that now brings me to the relevance of Myanmar's Article 8 reservation, which um, Professor Dajon, I feel, misunderstands. 
What he did accept is that Myanmar's reservation has a bearing on the ability to seize the court. And indeed, how could it be otherwise, given that the clear wording of Article 8, namely in French and Spanish, uses terms typically used in relation to court proceedings. Uh, and its drafting history shows various attempts to limit the scope of season to only some of the organs of the United Nations were rejected. So there's agreement between the parties on that point. Professor Dajon did claim, however, that Myanmar's interpretation is not bona fide. Yet on the contrary, it's the Gambia's interpretation of Article 8 and Myanmar's reservation there too that's not in line with accepted principles of treaty interpretation since it empties both Article 8 as well as the reservation to which the Gambia did not object of any relevance. Um, as a matter of fact, contrary to what you heard this morning, Myanmar's argument based on its Article 8 reservation is not depriving Article 9 of any meaning. Rather, it's Myanmar's interpretation that brings Article 8 and Article 9 in line. Otherwise, the fact that Article 8 governs the season of the court, which we understand is now accepted by the Gambia, would be redundant and completely useless. As you will recall, Article 8 provides that any state, I repeat, any state, may seize the court <coughs> once acts of genocide are in the process of being committed. It's thus Article 8, not Article 9, that might imply that any state party, even if not specially affected, might seize the court and thus allow for some kind of actio popularis. In other words, if there is any possibility of an actio popularis under the Genocide Convention, if, then that is the effect of Article 8 rather than of Article 9. This obvious effect of Article 8 has so far simply not been relevant, given that in all previous cases under the Genocide Convention, it was the specially affected state, be it Bosnia or Croatia, that had brought the case. Uh, what's even more is that none of the cases which the court has so far dealt with under the Genocide Convention involved a reservation to Article 8. Thus, the court has never had to pronounce upon the relevance of Article 8 for the season of the court. But in this case, where Myanmar has made a reservation to Article 8, the effect must be that the court cannot be seized of a case under the Genocide Convention by a non-injured, non-specially affected state uh, in circumstances um, where the respondent state has an Article 8 reservation but has not made a reservation to Article 9. It's obvious that where a contracting party has neither a reservation to Article 8 nor to Article 9, the distinction between the season of the court, regulated by Article 8 and is accepted by the Gambia, and the court's jurisdiction, governed by Article 9, is somewhat academic. But as I said yesterday, a valid season is a necessary precondition for the exercise of the court's jurisdiction. The effect of Myanmar's reservation to Article 8 is that this provision has to be read as providing that not any contracting party may seize the court with a dispute that it might have with Myanmar. Myanmar's reservation to Article 8 
on that interpretation therefore has the legal effect of limiting the right to seize the court to those contracting parties that are specifically affected by the alleged violations of the Genocide Convention, provided at least that the court has jurisdiction under Article 9. Finding otherwise would not only render Article 8 completely redundant and obsolete, but also, and more importantly, the reservation that Myanmar made to Article 8, a reservation that has been accepted by the Gambia. So to summarize, in contrast, for instance, to Article 33 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Genocide Convention on this interpretation distinguishes between a broad power to seize the court on the one hand, regulated by Article 8, and a more limited compromisory clause in Article 9 on the other. And it's exactly this difference that explains the fact that Myanmar, while entering a reservation to Article 8 of the Genocide Convention, did not at the same time enter a reservation to Article 9. The effect of the reservation to Article 8 is to preclude the season of the court by any contracting party. That is to say, parties to the Genocide Convention that are not injured states. It thus has the effect to preclude any form of actio popularis by any not specifically affected contracting party to the Genocide Convention. On the other hand, it doesn't preclude the court from exercising jurisdiction, provided that it was seized by an injured state and providing that the court has jurisdiction. Hence, Bangladesh, being the specially affected state, which is another qualification that the Gambia has not challenged during its pleadings, Bangladesh is not barred by the Article 8 reservation from seizing the court on this possible interpretation, since Bangladesh, unlike the Gambia, is not just any state within the meaning of Article 8 of the Convention. Um, had it not been for Bangladesh's own Article 9 reservation, um, the court would have had jurisdiction, and it's that reservation to Article 9, which again did not appear in the submissions this morning. It's exactly the purpose of the reservation to Article 8 um, to preclude attempts to circumvent the limitations on the court's jurisdiction under Article 9. And I submit that it is not contrary to the principle of good faith um, to limit attempts to bring an actio popularis through the making of a reservation to Article 8, given that this court has upheld time and again that Article 9 reservations, which exclude the court's jurisdiction in toto, are permissible under the Genocide Convention. Um, let us also note that even Professor Sands, who is proud of the concept of actio popularis, accepts that a state may validly accept such a right to bring a case without being specially affected by an alleged treaty violation. So let us assume for a minute that Senegal had entered a reservation when acceding to the United Nations Convention Against Torture to the effect that only injured states may bring a case before the court under Article 30 of that convention. Under those circumstances, any state would have been barred unless the state could claim to be specially affected by Senegal's violations of the Convention Against Torture. 
and it's exactly the same limited effect that Myanmar's Article 8 reservation has when it comes to the ability of states' parties to seize the court with a case under Article 9. Um, let me end by noting the repeated attempts of Professor Sands to frighten the court as to what might be the possible effects of a decision in this case denying provisional measures, stating that it might put the court in the wilderness for two decades. Um, apart from the fact that, as the saying goes, fear is a bad advisor, it's worth recalling that the court has not shied away from making findings that a state was either not responsible for genocide or that genocide had not happened in the first place, even where those findings uh, were contrary to findings previously made by other actors, including other organs of the United Nations. And we submit that this is the essential function of the court as the principal judicial rather than political organ of the United Nations. Uh, moreover, the reference to your Southwest Africa judgment is also misplaced for other reasons. For one, in that case, the effect of the judgment was that no state whatsoever could bring a case against South Africa for the violations of the mandate. Uh, in contrast there too, um, in this case, specially affected states might bring a case against Myanmar, provided there's a valid jurisdictional bond under Article 9. Um, and beyond this, Myanmar also accepts that even where a specially affected state such as Bangladesh is not able to bring a case given its own Article 9 reservation, it might still take countermeasures against Myanmar provided Myanmar were to commit a violation of the Genocide Convention. Mr. President, finally I turn to the wording of the provisional measures requested by the Gambia. Uh, Mr. Sands suggested this morning that the provisional measures concerning preservation of evidence and granting access to UN bodies is consistent with the jurisprudence of the court and that it builds on the frontier dispute case. But this was said without analysis. The comparison with that case is not apt. That case, as the court will recall, concerned a dispute between the Republic of Upper Volta, now Burkina Faso, and the Republic of Mali concerning part of their common frontier. Consistently with the court's jurisprudence in other cases concerning the use of force, the court addressed its order in identical terms to both parties. To refrain from action which might extend or aggravate the dispute or which might impede the gathering of evidence, to withdraw their forces behind lines to be agreed and to continue to observe the recently agreed ceasefire. And in regard to administration of the disputed areas, to refrain from modifying the situation which had prevailed before the armed actions giving rise to the conflict. There was nothing novel in the provisional measures ordered in the frontier dispute case. They were framed with care to ensure balance between the parties and to avoid prejudging the outcome of the case. Their object was to seek to preserve the rights of both parties. There's nothing in the order which paves the way for the use of the court's limited jurisdiction under Article 41 to impose on the parties new obligations under international law. Indeed, the court was at pains to emphasize in the frontier dispute case that the court is not empowered at the stage of provisional measures to modify the situation which prevailed before the armed action leading to the filing of the party's request. The court's powers are confined to safeguarding existing rights on each party, not imposing new obligations. The use of provisional measures to create new substantive obligations on member states goes beyond the power in Article 41 to preserve the respective rights of parties to a dispute and has no support in the jurisprudence of this court. 
As was noted by this court in its judgment in Legrand, the power of the court under, 40, under Article 41 uh, to indicate provisional measures is based on the necessity when circumstances call for it to safeguard and avoid prejudice to the rights of the parties as determined by the final judgment of the court. This idea of preservation is probably the most essential element in the concept of provisional measures. It requires the court to look both at the risk of irremediable prejudice being caused to the applicant, as well as the risk of causing irremediable prejudice to the respondent if it turns out that interim relief should not have been granted. Therefore, the court must carefully consider the consequences that might follow were it to indicate the measures sought. And it's therefore submitted that the court should be wary of indicating provisional measures in cases where there's a complex situation on the ground in relation to which various diplomatic and practical initiatives are in play without sufficient understanding of the effects that such provisional measures might have. For instance, whatever the reasons may be for the lack of significant repatriation so far, there is widespread support for the principle that repatriations should occur. It must be questioned, what would be the effect on such support of a finding by this court that those returning to Myanmar would be at imminent risk of genocide. The provisional measures hearing by its nature is limited in scope and does not afford an opportunity for the court to weigh all the advantages and all the disadvantages of different courses of action. Where there is an urgent need for something specific to preserve the rights of a party the appropriateness of a provisional measure focused on that specific matter may be obvious. However, the court is simply not in a position to make such assessments in relation to measures expressed in broad and general terms, the precise implications of which in practice cannot be known. I elaborated yesterday on the problems of the provisional measures proposed by the Gambia in this case. Mr. President, members of the court, that concludes my observations. I would now invite you to call on Professor Chavez. I thank Mr. Staker for his statement, and I shall now give the floor to Professor Chavez. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, for giving me the floor again in these proceedings on provisional measures. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, there have been many references to the fact-finding mission set up by the Human Rights Council. Indeed, the case set before you by the Gambia relies essentially entirely on that report on the reports of the fact-finding mission. For this reason, this morning, the Gambia sought to defend the criticisms that were made and the observations about the quality of the report of the fact-finding mission. Yesterday, I criticized the fact-finding mission, amongst other things, for the allegation in the report recently issued in 2019 that genocidal intent had strengthened. And you may recall, on a Tuesday's hearing, counsel for the Gambia laid considerable emphasis on this observation as a way of bolstering the argument favoring provisional measures. This morning, it was suggested that I had actually not studied the report adequately and that I had missed some important paragraphs and relevant portions. I would not want the court to think that I made such a statement here without thoroughly reviewing the fact-finding mission report. I've studied that report. The recent one is more than is about 200 pages long. 
as well as the longer one from the previous year, more than 400 pages in length. I've read every paragraph. Mr. Reichler referred to paragraph 9, where the fact-finding mission set out its summary explanation for why it thought genocidal intent was strengthening in 2019 compared to 2018. Members of the court may already have noticed that when he actually recited the reasons, the word continuation appeared more than once. Paragraph 9 speaks of, and I quote, continued denial of their citizenship and ethnic identity, the living conditions to which it subjects them, its failure to reform laws that subjugate the Rohingya people, the continuation of hate speech directed at the Rohingya, its prior con commission of genocide, and its disregard for accountability. We find all of these points in the 2018 report. There's nothing new. They are the same allegations. The indicators that were pointed to in the 2018 report are the same that are repeated in the 2019 report. If anything, the 2018 report, with its description of the conflict in 2017, of the deaths, of the abuses, of the, uh, all of those allegations, is much worse in the 2018 report than in the 2019 report. This explains my conclusion that it was only the opinion of the fact-finding mission to use the label genocide and to affirm that there was genocidal intent that strengthened. And my suggestion to the court is that it not take into account the claim in the report of 2019 that the genocidal intent that it purports to identify has strengthened. Mr. President, members of the court, this morning we were shown slides relating to the position of the United Nations High, Commissioner for High Commission for Refugees. Uh, there were two slides that were shown by my recollection. And the implication seemed to be that Myanmar had presented the court with a partial picture, or that perhaps that even attempted to mislead the court. Some of you may have noticed, if you've studied the slides, that the references were to documents from the UN High Commission for Refugees from 2018, one of them quite early in the year 2018, indeed almost two years ago. Whereas the document that Myanmar referred to yesterday was more recent. It was dated November 2019, one month ago. And it clearly indicated that the reality on the ground is fluid and that there is ongoing and meaningful engagement between the parties attempting to deal with a difficult situation. In fact, the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in the most recent report of November 2019 outline the main challenges facing communities in Rakhine State and the need to address these in order to repatriate those who are displaced. The report indicated three short-term next steps that the parties need to undertake. And the UN High Commissioner for Refugees expressed continued commitment to assess the needs of those who are displaced and how they might be met by the government of Myanmar. This morning, Council for the Gambia produced a news clipping indicating a deployment of troops before the events of late August 2017. The implication being that the Army's operations on 25 August 2019 and the subsequent days had been planned well in advance. But whatever the time of deployment, the fact remains that there were more than 30 attacks launched simultaneously on the 25th of August 2017. And these were obviously not planned by the authorities of Myanmar. Let me also remind the court that the internal armed conflict started with the earlier ARSA attacks in October of 2016, 10 months before the deployment that was referred to in the newspaper clipping shown to you this morning. It should go without saying that there would have been several deployments and rotations of personnel during this period. There is nothing sinister about this. 
If anything, the presentation of such a news clipping shows the risks associated with a selective approach to the facts in Rakhine State. Counsel for the applicant made many comments this morning about what, were labeled, what was labeled the failure of Myanmar to deny certain allegations of a factual nature. But we were told this is not a proceeding on the merits, and we have been warned not to engage in such a debate by practice direction 11. Yesterday, I quite clearly said that with reference to the case law of the court, establishing that one or more of the punishable acts listed in Article 2 of the Genocide Convention had never been a problem to litigants. And for that reason, I made it clear that I would therefore not concern myself with this dimension of the case, but rather direct my attention to the part that the Gambia had virtually ignored in its submissions and what is really the essence of this case, which is the mental element. This morning, the applicant went through rather methodically a list of indicators that was considered by the fact-finding mission in reaching its conclusion about genocidal intent. This list appears to be derived from a detailed matrix which has been prepared by the UN Office on Genocide Prevention, presided over by the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. The relevant document was entitled Framework of Analysis for Atrocity Crimes, a Tool for Prevention, and it's referred to in several paragraphs of the 2019 report. It, this confirms, by the way, that the list of indicators de developed by the Office on Genocide Prevention was in fact inspired by this matrix of factors, the framework of analysis adopted in New York by the Office on Genocide Prevention. I checked my records yesterday evening to confirm that I had personally assisted in the preparation of this document, the framework of analysis, joining the two special advisors and the professionals at sessions where these were discussed and developed. I've always been intrigued by the list. People engaged in the field of genocide have struggled for many years to see if a formula, some sort of framework could be developed that would identify the potential, the warning signs of genocide. It's always a problem because the lists that are prepared, the attempts at preparing a list, inevitably consist of long recitals of human rights violations that indeed may be present, and, and in fact are inevitably present, if a genocide takes place, but that are also present in so many other environments and so many other contexts where genocide has not taken, pla taken place, is not taking place, and is highly, highly unlikely to take place. These lists of indicators are very long. There are many countries represented in this room, I dare say, that virtually every country where people in this room come from will tick several of the boxes on those lists of indicators of genocidal risk factors. One need only to confirm this, read the reports of the treaty bodies of the United Nations and the reports under the Universal Periodic Review submitted to the Human Rights Council. The special advisor uses the list to identify situations. I mentioned yesterday, and it was not challenged, contested, or explained by the counsel for the applicant this morning that the special advisor has not referred to Myanmar for 15 months, and in that same time has issued declarations on several other situations in the world that are very far from being situations where there is a serious risk of genocide. We could return to the discussion in the report that was referred to by Mr. Reichler in his submission this morning. The indicators that were cited begin with extreme brutality. We can well imagine how many countries will generate evidence of extreme brutality. The second was the organized nature of the uh, activities or of the acts. Again, this is present in many, many situations. The third is sexual violence, a phenomenon that regrettably occurs in many parts of the world, 
and that we all condemn unequivocally. The fourth, hate speech. But let me linger on that point for a few minutes. Mr. President, members of the court, hate speech is a phenomenon that's not reserved to Myanmar. Not only do we have hate speech in many parts of the world, in many countries, but debates rage about how robust should be the legal intervention to address it. And some countries insist that it may even fall within the protected domain of freedom of expression. As an example, counsel referred to a Facebook page from 2017. We did not debate this on Tuesday and Wednesday, although it was a significant feature in the fact-finding missions report of 2018 and might well have been an object of some discussion in the earlier, uh, in the first phase of the proceedings. The fact-finding mission each year has issued a short report as well as a long report. I've referred to the long reports, consisting of hundreds of pages, but there's a much shorter report issued each year of about 20 pages. And the reason for the long report, as I'm sure many members of the court are aware, is to circumvent the rule within the United Nations on the length of reports. So the short report is the official document, the one that is formally presented to the Human Rights Council. The short report in 2018 had a very summary discussion of genocide to which I referred the court in my presentation yesterday. I had drawn the courts, attempted to draw the court's attention to the relevant paragraphs because of the hesitant way in which the, commission refer, the mission referred to genocide. In its paragraphs dealing with war crimes and crimes against humanity, it was quite unequivocal and said war crimes and crimes against humanity had been committed. Whereas when it turned to genocide, it was less certain, less definitive, saying that this was something to be determined by a court. In its explanation for gen genocidal intent, and this is where we return to the hate speech issue, it referred to only one fact, which was a reference to the Tatmadaw commander, the military commander in chief, to clearance operations, and it cited this famous Facebook post. In discussing the inferences of intent at paragraph 86 of the 2018 report, it recalled, and I quote, the statement made by the Tatmadaw commander in chief that the clearance operation is not a reference to ARSA, but to the, quote, unfinished job, unquote, of solving the, quote, long-standing Bengali problem. The paragraph then has a reference right in the text to paragraph 35, except when one turns to paragraph 35, it doesn't quite say the same thing. It refers to the Facebook post of 2 September 2018, said to be at the height of operations, of the operations, this must be a typographical mistake because the height of the operations was 2017, not 2018. And then the Facebook quote says the following, according to paragraph 35. The Bengali problem is a long-standing one which has become an unfinished job despite the efforts of the previous government to solve it. The government in office is taking great care in solving the problem. This is the damning evidence of genocidal intent allegedly. There is no reference here to clearance operations, despite what was said later in the report and the suggestion that this reference in the Facebook post was to clearance, refer uh, to clearance operation. And just to be clear, there's no confusion about this. The text that I've just cited, the one that doesn't refer to clearance operations, in paragraph 35 of the short report for 2018, appears again with, uh, with no change, in paragraph 753 of the long report that accompanies the short report. Again, there is no reference to clearance operations. All I can say is that the fact-finding mission wasn't very careful in its reference to the Facebook post, despite the fact that this allegation seemed to it to be crucial, central to its claim of genocidal intent. Be that as it may, the statement 
on the Facebook post is one to which many different meanings can be attached. It certainly couldn't be described as hate speech, not the sort of thing that we hear about circulating on Facebook and other social media in many parts of the world. May I remind the court that in the past, it has also been presented with allegations of hate speech or of genocide incitement made to support charges that the Genocide Convention has been breached. In the Croatia versus Serbia case, counsel for the respondent dealing with the counterclaim by Serbia referred to the famous, the notorious Brioni Conference during which the president of Croatia had made statements that left open a possible interpretation that they were genocidal in nature. And this court dismissed the argument, recognizing that under the circumstances and taking into account the context, it was unreasonable to draw such a conclusion. And I would submit that the same should be the case with regard to the Facebook post presented this morning as an example of hate speech and in the report of the fact-finding mission as evidence of genocidal intent. There are no doubt many examples of hate speech circulating on social media within Myanmar. Counsel for the applicant referred to this in the Tuesday session, but left in my view the impression that was not sufficiently clear for the court that these were examples from private individuals. This was not government hate speech. These were individuals sending uh, tweet messages and so on on social media. And again, this is a phenomenon that is not reserved to Myanmar, of private individuals indulging in forms of hate speech through social media and on the internet. And I am sure that some of it goes on in the very city in which we sit today. Myanmar is not an exception to this, but nor does it, does evidence of such speech make any meaningful contribution to the thesis that the state harbors a genocidal intent. Let me continue with the remainder of the list of indicators that were provided. The fifth of them is discriminatory policies about citizenship and residency. This is clearly an important grievance of the refugee population who have made grants of citizenship a condition for their return and apparently have refused to return until the matter is addressed in a satisfactory manner. But again, the existence of discriminatory plans and policies dealing with citizenship and mobility and entry to the country is hardly the monopoly of Myanmar in our modern world. The sixth indicator, it's really related to the hate speech issue, is the tolerance of public rhetoric of hate speech. Again, examples in other countries come to mind. And finally, the failure to prosecute. You have the explanation as to the difficulty of prosecution, but this too is a problem that we confront in many parts of the world. I should point out that Article 6 of the Genocide Convention specifically contemplates the form of accountability that Council for the Gambia this morning dismissed. Article, Article 6 of the Convention states, persons charged with genocide or any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3 shall be tried by a competent tribunal of the state in the territory of which the act was committed or by such international penal tribunal as may have jurisdiction with respect to those contracting parties which shall have accepted its jurisdiction. And we know the answer to that criterion which is not fulfilled in this case. It's clear that the convention creates a strong presumption that it's in fact the state where the crimes took place, where the crimes should be prosecuted. That's the state that bears the responsibility. Some new documents were put into the judge's folder today and were suggested to have some relevance to the proceedings. The first, a press release from the US Department of the Treasury that lists some military leaders in Myanmar, as well as individuals in other countries. I'm not quite sure from the remarks of counsel for the Gambia what exactly this was intended to prove, because I didn't find any references to genocide in the document. 
I'm struck by the fact that this was all presented in the context of a discussion of accountability, and it was related somehow to the manner in which a pardon had been given to those convicted with regard to summary execution. Of course, this issue was addressed very directly by the agent for Myanmar in yesterday's hearing. And you will recall that she expressed the fact that many in Myanmar were dismayed by the pardon. The reference by Mr. Reichler to the US Treasury as a moral authority for the denunciation of Myanmar, and then the reference to pardoning perpetrators as a whiff of hypocrisy, because we have examples from other countries including his own, of governments pardoning perpetrators. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Counsel for the applicant then turned to these appalling images of a group of men being summarily executed. This, this was sensationalist and quite gratuitous. It's difficult to understand what point the Gambia was attempting to make or why those photographs were submitted. Yesterday, the agent for Myanmar spoke of how the perpetrators of this summary execution had been brought to justice and convicted of crimes. What exactly was the point in dispute? Why did you and the people in the courtroom have to see those pictures? Let me say a word about the issue of the mass graves, because I was the one who raised the point in yesterday's proceedings. I made it in the context of discussing the total number of deaths in the recent period. And I noted, and this is in the transcript, page 37, paragraph 48, and I quote, the fact-finding mission, moreover, provides numerous aerial photographs, yet nowhere does it point to any evidence of mass graves. In his remarks this morning, Mr. Reichler translated this sentence into the suggestion that I said there are no mass graves. As you can see, I never said there were no mass graves. I said there's no mention of them by the fact-finding mission with regard to the aerial photographs. So we were pointed today to a news report from AP that apparently located five mass graves although the news report does not clarify exactly where they were or how many bodies we're talking about. But that being said, why did the fact-finding mission not refer to the mass graves with reference to the AP story? Why is this not mentioned in the report of the fact-finding mission? Yesterday I said that this was the first application of the Genocide Convention where an estimate of the total number of victims was not provided by the applicant. The silence of the applicant in the oral proceedings continued into the second round. You may recall that yesterday I anticipated that my colleagues from the Gambia would answer that it's not a numbers game. And indeed, that point was made by Mr. Sands. But beyond that, the only contribution to the discussion was the remark that there are ample authorities that an attack on a relatively small number can be sustained as genocide. The example, it wasn't given this morning, but it's in the footnote of the transcript, which we received a little over an hour ago, is to the Srebrenica massacre. The reference is in the Karadzic decision and in the judgment of this court. That's all. There are no other authorities. I don't believe they exist. Recently, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia attempted, as he has done on other occasions, to invoke the Srebrenica precedent in order to charge the crime of genocide with respect to much lower levels of killing than at Srebrenica. Levels of killing similar to the ones that were mentioned on Tuesday, drawn from the report of the fact-finding missions, and the judges have consistently refused to follow him. A final point, and this is a bit awkward, personally painful for me, is the reference to an interview that I did with Al Jazeera several years ago, 
I suppose I should be flattered that counsel for the applicant thinks my views are so authoritative, although I suspect the intent was more to embarrass myself or my client. I did, a, as I recall, a one-hour interview with a journalist from Al Jazeera. Two clips of a matter of seconds were taken from the interview. The journalist persistently tried to get me to apply the word genocide to the situation in Myanmar at the time. I believe it was done in late 2012 or perhaps the beginning of 2013. And I just as consistently refused because I've never said that Myanmar, that genocide was taking place in, in Myanmar. I have never said that. The gen journalist then posed a hypothetical question saying that if certain things were established, would it be frivolous to use the word? And it's to that that I answered no. My views will be a lot clearer if we could get a copy of the tape of the entire interview. But it's hardly important. Really, the issue before this court is not what I or anyone else may have said or thought about genocide. It's about the facts, about the international law, and the interpretation that this court gives to the Genocide Convention. Mr. President, members of the court, may I now turn to the issue of the content of the provisional measures with reference, uh, as has been made by counsel on several occasions, to the 1993 orders of the court. The first in April 1993, and then the second in September 1993, which really just confirmed the order in, of April 1993. These orders, of course, ultimately led to findings of the court in the 2007 judgment. I think it's important in understanding the weight that should be given to the orders of 1993, the way in which we understand them, to appreciate the context in terms of the legal development of the, of the crime of genocide. Because in 1993, when those orders were issued, there was really no case law on the subject of genocide. There was the advisory opinion of 1951, of course, which was concerned primarily with the issue of reservations and of entry into force of the convention, and not with the interpretation of Article 2, which is really at the core of the issues before the court uh, here. I think in 1993, it was unclear as to whether the court would adopt a broad interpretation of the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, as many had urged over the years, or a narrow one. That only became clear many years later. Moreover, and I've taken the time, as I'm sure some of you have in recent days, to review the debates, the proceedings, the oral hearings, and the issuance of the uh, orders in 1993 to see just how summary they were, how quickly the proceedings took place, how the issue of whether summary, whether provisional measures order should be um, proposed or not was not really contested because both sides asked for it. Both sides. So there was nobody there arguing that maybe it wasn't appropriate. And raising some of the concerns in such circumstances to which Mr. Saker referred only a few minutes ago. And it was certainly not unreasonable in 1993 for the court to issue an order based on a relatively low threshold, given the uncertainty, the, the unknown, about how the issue of genocide would be dealt with on the merits, and the novelty of a situation that was underway in April of 1993 in the former Yugoslavia. I beg the court to indulge me just a little deviation into the history of the convention and the notion of genocide in order to illustrate this point. Yesterday, I had wanted to mention an anniversary, as counsel did on the 10th of December, mentioning that it was Human Rights Day. Yesterday, the 11th of December, was the 73rd anniversary of the genocide resolution of 1946 that ultimately led to the adoption of the convention itself. I was concerned yesterday that I'd run out of time. I'm not so worried about that today. 
to understand why the definition of genocide is narrow. I'm not talking about the interpretation, I'm talking just about the text. We need to go back 75 years to the London Conference when the concept of crimes against humanity was codified for the purpose of prosecution in the Nuremberg Tribunal. Much of it, much has been written about this, including a wonderful book by someone who's here in the courtroom, Philippe Sands' book, East-West Street, explaining the major contribution of the Nuremberg Tribunal to the progressive development of international law, when he reported back to President Truman, the prosecutor, Robert Jackson, who was also a justice of the US Supreme Court, said, and I quote, the most significant result of applying these concepts are to outlaw aggression and to condemn the notion of persecution of minorities clearing the path to war. Note that Robert Jackson refers not to the prosecution, to the persecution, I'm sorry, the persecution of minorities as such, but to the more limited purpose of clearing the road to war. And to understand what he meant, we have to consult the transcript of the London Conference. There, discussing the scope of the crime of crimes against humanity, Jackson said, and I quote, ordinarily, we do not consider that acts of a government towards its citizens warrant our interference. We have some regrettable circumstances in our own country in which minorities are unfairly treated. We think it's justifiable that we interfere or attempt to bring retribution only because the concentration camps were in pursuit of a common plan or enterprise of making unjust or illegal war in which we became involved. Raphael Lemkin, about whom we've spoken on previous days, the man who coined the term genocide, was in Nuremberg when the judgment of the International Military Tribunal was issued, and he was very disturbed by the limitation on crimes against humanity. There is an account from a former prosecutor, I'm sure some of you had occasion to meet him over the years, the late Henry King, describing the encounter with Lemkin in the lobby of the Grand Hotel the day after the judgment was issued. He said, and I quote, Lemkin was very upset. He was concerned that the decision of the IMT, the Nuremberg Court, did not go far enough in dealing with genocidal actions. This was because the IMT limited its judgment to wartime genocide and did not include peacetime genocide. And Lemkin rushed back to New York and lobbied at the UN General Assembly convincing three representatives of member states, India, Cuba, and Panama, to propose a resolution recognizing genocide as a crime under international law that can be committed in peacetime as well as in time of war. In November 1946, the resolution was proposed by the Cuban ambassador, Ernesto de Higo, and he said in his speech in the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly, that, quote, at the Nuremberg trial, it was not possible to prosecute genocide committed in peacetime because it was committed before the war. And he said, fearing that such a crime may remain unpunished, owing to the principle nullum crimen sine lege, the representative of Cuba asks that genocide be declared a crime under international law. And so there were two resolutions adopted 73 years ago. Resolution 95, confirming the principles that were established in the Charter of the Tribunal and in the Judgment, and Resolution 96 on the subject of genocide, the crime of genocide. It was to fill, Resolution number 96, as the Cuban ambassador explained, was to fill a gap in Resolution 95, the gap of crimes against humanity. But the gap was only partially filled in 1948 with the adoption of the Convention. The Convention made clear that it was applicable to peacetime as well as wartime, in effect answering Lemkin's concern. But the Convention does not codify a broad protection of minorities from persecution. It only protects minorities from destruction. The price to pay for agreement on a Convention, the Convention that the Court is now seized with. 
was a narrow definition of genocide, confined not to the persecution of minorities, but only to their physical destruction. And this has been confirmed in the case law of this court. In the 1990s, international criminal law went through a period of rapid development. Among the evidence that marked this new period was the application filed before this court and the issuance of the Provisional Measures Orders of March 1993, and, uh, or of April 93 and of September 93, the establishment of the Yugoslavia Tribunal in May of 1993, and the conclusion of the work of the International Law Commission on a draft statute for a permanent court under the leadership of its special rapporteur, Professor Crawford, as he then was. Subsequently, there was a dramatic expansion, both as to the institutional mechanisms for prosecution and the substantive content of the law. War crimes were extended to non-international armed conflict, and crimes against humanity were extended to apply in time of peace as well as in war. This progressive development of the law was entrenched in Articles 7 and 8 of the Rome Statute. It may seem somewhat paradoxical that in such a period of dynamism and development, the definition of genocide in Article 6, which is essentially identical to Article 2 of the Convention, did not undergo the same evolution. But at the Rome Conference, there was no interest in amending the definition of genocide, despite decades of criticism of its narrowness and limited scope. This was actually easy to understand. With the expansion of crimes against humanity to peacetime, the very issue that had prompted Lemkin's initiative at the first session of the General Assembly, there was little, if any, reason to enlarge the definition of genocide. There was no longer a gap to be filled. And nevertheless, efforts have been continued by those hoping that the definition of genocide will be broadened to encompass a broader range of acts and to accompany this an understanding of genocidal intent that goes beyond physical destruction and extends to acts of persecution. Twice in this court, in recent years, in the Bosnia and the Croatia cases, counsel have urged such an expansion, and twice they have failed. The Gambia's application and the submission made this week reminds me of the words of an American baseball player known for his pithy aphorisms, who once said, this is a case of deja vu all over again. Why do I insist on this historical perspective? Because at the heart of the debate is whether the court should maintain its position, solidly rooted in its jurisprudence, to borrow its own expression, or take a new direction. And while this debate will feature if the case ever goes to the merits, it is also extraordinarily relevant to the debate on provisional measures. As I said, these issues were not debated at the Provisional Merit Measures stage in 1993. As I said, both parties requested them. Yugoslavia's response to Bosnia's application that they wanted Provisional Measures too against the Bosniaks. And this is why those orders are of very limited relevance and assistance in addressing the issues today, some 26 years later. The fact that issues relating to atrocities perpetrated against minorities committed in peacetime would be addressed by an expansion of the definition of crimes against humanity could not have been known to the court in 1993 or to the parties. Today we have a situation lamented by counsel for the applicant. We heard more of that this morning. And lamented, as was lamented by counsel for the applicants in the Croatia and the Bosnia cases, where there is a demanding standard for proof of genocidal intent. I won't repeat my remarks on this yesterday, but it's clear that today the court imposes such a demanding standard, whereas that was not clear by any means in 1993. It does not seem to be sound judicial policy in 2019 that there should be a low standard for an order of provisional measures if the applicant confronts a very high and demanding standard on the merits. The criteria for the indication of provisional measures should correspond in some way to the criteria for success on the merits. 
I'm not here speaking about the prima facie issue, but rather about the plausibility issue. The plausibility issue at the provisional measure stage must bear a relationship to the likelihood of success on the merits. This is the point. It's clear that on this issue, there's a serious difference in the position of the Gambia and of Myanmar that the court will need to address in its decision. But again, at the risk of repeating myself, there is a problem with a legal mechanism whereby the standard for provisional measures is very low and is out of all proportion to any likelihood of success on the merits. Counsel for the applicant tried to contend that genocidal intent may coexist with other intents. And he made reference to the court's case law. But the court's case law was not addressing the coexistence of genocidal intent with other intents. It was saying that acts characterized as ethnic cleansing might also be considered genocidal if there was genocidal intent. I think this is quite different from the point Council was making. And I don't believe that's in conflict in any way with what the court said about drawing inferences from patterns of conduct. The hour is late. I'm not going to read the citations. I apologize to the court for some of the hasty preparation. We had three hours between the morning session to get our text together. The relevant paragraphs, they were cited this morning. Paragraph 190 in the Bosnia decision. Paragraph 163 in the, Cre in the Croatia decision. The Croatia decision, commenting on the earlier ruling in, 90, in, in the Bosnia decision and endorsing it, says that the court has no reason to depart from its previous conclusions. In order to determine whether forced displacements constitute genocide, it will seek to ascertain whether those forced displacements took place in such circumstances that they were calculated to bring about the physical destruction of the group. Many features of the circumstances alleged in the application, including the relatively small number of deaths compared with the overall population, the huge migration flows, the presence within Myanmar of many hundreds of thousands who have not been subject to violent attacks with lethal consequences or other threats to life since the events of September 2017, argue against the inference that such forced displacements took place in such circumstances that they were calculated to bring about the physical destruction of the group. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, members of the court, for your attention. Mr. President, may I respectfully ask if you would give the floor to Her Excellency, the agent for Myanmar. I, think pro I thank Professor Shebas for his statement. I shall now give the floor to the agent of Myanmar, Her Excellency, Mrs. Aung San Suu Kyi to make a closing statement on behalf of Myanmar. You have the floor, madam. Mr. President and members of the court, it is not disputed that Myanmar, like the United Kingdom or the United States, has a military justice system. The constitution of Myanmar cannot and should not be ignored if we are serious about establishing constitutional democracy and rule of law in Myanmar. International criminal tribunals take four to eight years to undertake investigations of core international crimes, sometimes longer. Just over two years have passed since the serious internal armed conflict against the Arsa and the second court martial is now underway. The Gambia has not challenged the quality of the military justice in the Indian case, only the pardon, which many of us regret. The ongoing Gutabian court martial in Budiram Township should be allowed to run its course. I'm confident that there will be further courts martial after the submission of the final report of the Independent Commission of Inquiry in a few weeks. Mr. President, it is vital for Myanmar's present and future 
that our civilian and military criminal justice systems functions in accordance with the Constitution. Where a country has a military justice system, neutralizing this system by externalizing justice, in effect, surgically removes a critical limb from the body, the limb that helps armed forces to self-correct, to improve, to better perform their functions within the constitutional order. Mr. President, members of the court, in my opening statement yesterday, I mentioned that international justice is a practice that affirms our common values and that we look to justice as a champion of reconciliation and harmony that will assure the security and rights of all peoples. Allow me in this context to mention one example of what we are doing on the ground in Northern Rakhine to further reconciliation between communities. In January 2019, the In Transformation Initiative, ITI, directed by Mr. Rolf Mayer, a transitional justice leader in South Africa, launched the Rakhine Transformation Project that aims at preventing the recurrence of historical violence and paving the way for sustainable voluntary return of peoples displaced by violence. In the words of Mr. Mayer himself, I quote, Nine months after its inception, and despite increased fighting in the area between the AA and the military, the project has gained sufficient traction in Moundor for it to be regarded as sustainable. Mr. President, recalling the words about football in paragraph 18 of the opening statement of the agent of the Gambia, allow me to present these pictures from a football match. Organized by the ITI, a football tournament recently took place at the Myoma Athletic Field in Moundor Town. Players and spectators are a mix from different communities in Moundor Township, the area at the center of the 2016 to 2017 internal armed conflict in Rakhine. Adults and children, proud, enthusiastic, laughing, and most important of all, together. This is what we are striving to nurture in Rakhine, what we are endeavoring to foster throughout Myanmar, our country of great diversity, great potential, and great challenges. Mr. President, members of the court, I pray the decision you make with the wisdom and vision of justice will help us to create unity out of diversity, to develop the potential of our people and to meet the challenges of a nation in quest of sustainable peace and development. Steps that generate suspicion, sow doubts, or create resentment between communities who have just begun to build a fragile foundation of trust could undermine reconciliation. Ending the ongoing internal armed conflict between the Arakan army and Myanmar's defense services is of the utmost importance for our country. But it is equally important to avoid any reignition of the 2016 to 2017 internal armed conflict in Northern Rakhine. Mr. President, members of the court, I now conclude by formally presenting to you the final submission of Myanmar. These are as follows. In accordance with Article 60, Paragraph 2, of the rules of court for the reasons given during the hearing from 10th to 12th December 2019 and any other reasons the court might deem appropriate, Myanmar requests the court to remove the case from its list. In the alternative, to reject the request for the indication of provisional measures submitted by the Gambia. Mr. President and members of the court, that concludes Myanmar's observations. I thank you for your kind attention, and I also thank the staff of the registry for all the assistance offered to our delegation. I thank the agent of Myanmar. The court takes note of the submissions of Myanmar, which you have just read, which you have just read out on behalf of your government. 
This brings the present series of sittings to an end. I would like to thank the agencies, council and advocates of the two parties for their statements. In accordance with the usual practice, I shall request both agencies to remain at the court's disposal to provide any additional information the court may require. The court will render its order on the request for the indication of provisional measures as soon as possible. The agencies of the parties will be advised in due course as to the date on which the court will deliver its order at a public sitting. Since the court has no other business before it today, the sitting is declared closed. Thank <laughs> you.